Hi. Hi. <laughs> what up? What up? Uh, Welcome to Dude That's Fucked Up. I'm Erin. I'm Nicole. This how is y'all doing? The pod. Yeah. How you doing? What's going on? Uh, I hope you guys... Oh, well, you probably don't have a cocktail. We each are having a beverage. Yeah, I mean, it's Wednesday, technically. <laughs> yeah, it's Wednesday. You might be to driving this. to work. Don't So don't yeah. do that. But like, Don't be drinking a cocktail while doing that. But like, if you want to pause here and wait until this evening when you're home and you're safe mm-hmm. at home mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you don't have to go anywhere. Um, and you're in the bubble playa. <laughs> Take a <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my god yeah maybe you're doing that uh, i don't know i don't know yeah um well yeah but that's what uh, hope, you could do uh, i guess <laughs> I hope hope everybody's great um what's going on today well, what are we t- what are we gonna do we're gonna talk about some weird stuff dude um but before we do that do we have any business um I don't have any business, I don't think, do you? No, I uh the we got magnets. I they're up live in the store on we, our website, dtfpodcast.com. We, we got influencers already promoting them on social media. It's Laura oh, out shit. there, number one fan, doing a thing. <laughs> She's like, it's a steal <laughs> ordering <laughs> magnets. Uh so you know, there's that. We have a whole campaign going. Yes, 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 yes. Um, <laughs> Influencer driven. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, yeah, it's a. Uh, it's on the website. Like I said, fun stuff on the website. Uh, mm-hmm. Stickers and T-shirts as well. Um, if you guys have an idea for a merchandise item that you'd like, let me know, and I'll see what I can do. Love it. Oh my god. Yeah. Um, what else? Uh, I think that's it for business for me. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, anything fucked up for you this week? I don't even. I don't even have anything fucked up. I don't think. Oh shit. Do okay. you? Do you? Um. Okay. This might be TMI. <gasps> oh, I'm here for it. Uh, but like, you guys know, I'm like trying to keep my child alive, like by breastfeeding him, <laughs> and it's fucking hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and let me tell you a thing that's very hard and terrible about it. Oh, um. Good. So sometimes a thing can happen where, um, like when your ducks could get clogged <gasps> yeah. and, and if it happens like, like further back in the like milk duck, it's like, it hurts. It like makes your boob like a fucking solid brick Oh. and it hurts so bad. And it's like really, really painful. And if you don't like get it unclogged, you can get mastitis, which is like an infection in your <gasps> titty. You get like a fever and like flu, like symptoms and you're just like fucking miserable oh my god miserable um but you could also clog like a little duct like right on your like nipple (gasps) and when that happens it's called a bleb (gasps) and it's literally a blister on your fucking nipple oh my god and i got i've gotten them like several times but i had like such a bad one (gasps) the other day i had to it wouldn't like usually like you can unclog it like you like put like steam it on it yeah give it a steam facial yeah. In the shower, whatever. Um, or you, uh, yeah, like you could like get it, like get it unclogged in the shower or you can like soak it in vinegar, whatever. Uh, I had to, nothing was working. I had to fucking pop it with a needle. <gasps> I had to prick my own fucking nipple and it was like a piece of hardened milk under the <gasps> skin. And it's like a teeny oh. tiny, it's like a rock basically. Like a piece of sand. And it was so painful. Oh, my fucking God. I can't even tell you. Just such a teeny little thing. Oh, my God. So that's a thing that can happen. And it's crazy. And I was just like in the bathroom like, oh, fuck. You had to fucking perform an extraction on your own bleb? Yeah. Yeah. It was it was a huge relief, though. Like it instantly feels better. It's crazy. Oh, my God. Yeah, so I'm this shit's rough, that man. Happened. Yeah, dude. Are you almost done with that? When can you stop breastfeeding? <laughs> I mean, I've been like ready to stop like every single day forever. Oh. But like <laughs> Since but, like, you started. 
Well, because it's always been hard. It's yeah, never yeah. been easy. Yeah. But like finally got the hang of it like maybe a month and a half ago. Uh-huh. And everybody was like, oh, you'll get the hang of it within like a month or so. That did not happen. Oh. Had to like do like the tongue tie and lip tie surgery and all that shit on poor little baby Jack. And oh. then I've had – it's just it, like low supply and he just like wasn't getting enough food. And it's just like it's always been very fraught. Oh. And so this shit happens and I'm like, I'm fucking done with this shit. <laughs> fucking done. But then I just don't know how to stop because if I stop, then it'll like my titties will fill up and it'll hurt. And I have to like keep I have to like cut out feedings gradually. It's just like a whole process. Yeah. yeah, So it's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, you have to start it at some point because you don't want to be one of those moms where he's like five and he's like, can I have more titty? And you're like, yeah, he has like a full set of teeth. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. He's like already losing his baby teeth in his adult. Like he's like has braces and he's like judgment free. You know, people do whatever they're going to do, but, like, that's a no for me, dog. <laughs> uh, I'm not judgment-free, and if your kid can fucking pull your titty out of your bra, if your kid has learned to unhook your bra so that he could get some milk out of your titty, you're done. I don't like it. You're done. Yeah. <sighs> the, the minute he gets teeth and starts biting me, it's over. <laughs> if he's, like, journaling, yeah, you should stop breastfeeding. <laughs> If he's bringing home homework. <laughs> if you've opened a bank account for him. <laughs> if his 529 is ready to come collect for his college account, he's done. Uh, oh, shit. Yeah. So it's fucking hard, man. Don't oh, man. do not do it. No, oh, do God. it. It's good. It's great. It's fun. Whatever. Yeah. Fuck. Um <laughs> Yeah, so that's it. Um, I just had to get that off my chest. Oh, <laughs> did you just lift up your boobs? Yeah, I just shook my titties. <laughs> oh. Uh, well, what are we talking about today? Oh my God, I'm fucking stoked on this. Psyched. It's groovy. Oh, it's so groovy, guys. Um, <laughs> so a lot of people have been asking for more content about the fire festival Mm -hmm. so we've talked about fire festival multiple times and i'm just going to go ahead and like manage your expectations now and tell you we are not going to talk about fire festival per se Mm -mm. we've talked about it like randomly in in, like random episodes and we also did a episode uh, a commentary episode in our patreon Mm -hmm. uh in January about Fire Festival, just kind of our thoughts, feelings, um, judgments about it. The, do- the documentaries and, on yeah. Netflix and Hulu specifically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, we – and I also feel like there's just so much – discourse out there about it that like we can't add any much more to it really. Yeah. Um, so we're not going to talk about Fire Fest today. What we are going to talk about is the OG Fire Fest <gasps> – Woodstock. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. What a shit show. It just But makes, also Yeah. Oh. What a time damn. to be alive. What a time. Wow, wow, wow. So Fire Festival, like the organizers who were the brains behind Fire Festival, and I put brains in real big quotes. Uh, and spelled it with a Z. Yeah, brains, <laughs> and like took all the vowels out. <laughs> uh, they it put a Y in there. <laughs> Brian's, <laughs> Brian's. <laughs> um, they were like constantly referencing how Woodstock was pulled off, and they were just thinking that they could make it happen, um, kind of in the same way that Woodstock came about, because any. I think any festival is like a challenge unless you have it down. If you, especially if you're doing it for the first time, like there's a lot of moving parts. It's on a grand scale. Like you can't really fuck up too much. Uh, There's not a lot of wiggle room because if something bad happens, it's like going to be, it's going to be bad for a lot of people. So, um, and there, there's just like a lot of opportunity to fail when you do a festival. Mm -hmm. So fire festival, the dudes just, kept thinking like we could pull this off look at look at Woodstock look at Woodstock um and the reason they thought this was because yes there was a lot of 
like speed bumps along the way for Woodstock, but also a lot of things came together. I would say pretty cosmically uh, <laughs> for Woodstock and Fire Festival. You are no Woodstock. No, no, not even close. <laughs> I mean, no one, no one even ended up performing at Fire Festival. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, people couldn't even stay there. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, comparing them, Woodstock definitely ended up a lot better. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, we all know that it became one of the most important moments in music history. Oh, my God. Okay, um, Aaron and I watched, so you guys don't have to, a three-hour documentary on Woodstock. <laughs> I mean, you can. It's fucking cool. Oh, yeah. Uh, the best part, uh, well, it's, like, not really a documentary so much as it is, like, footage, which... It does go in, like, a narrative order of, like, what happened over the three days. So it does have that. But there's not, like, a lot of commentary or anything about what was going on. There's not, like, a ton of it. But No, they're, like, playing, like, the songs that were performed yeah, over, like, footage. Just, yeah. like, a lot of raw footage of the, you know, the, the lead up to the festival. And it's just, like, all... All at the location. Yeah. Um, which does not tell the full story no. by any means at all. No. But they, sh- and it's really cool. They show a lot of performances. They show a lot of like the, uh, you know, kind of uh, some of the behind the scenes, like during the festival, which is very interesting to see. There's like boobs and stuff. Like Pete was like, boobs. I was like, <laughs> people were naked there. Yeah. And, like, all the dudes are, like, hot hippies. Oh, my God. Like, building a stage. Woo! And they're all grandfathers now. (laughs) Oh, my God. I was going to say, every – these men, especially the guy that is – like, one of the guys that was running it in this documentary is, like, hot fire. Like, I was just, like, a a puddle the whole time, basically. Because I was, like, oh, my God. All these dudes. I would bang all of them. Yeah. Like – I mean, maybe not all of them, but – a lot. Like, f- flood my Woodstock field. <laughs> uh, just make uh, sure you you have your guitar. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Wow. It is. It's very interesting. So, and it's the original um, Woodstock film yep. from 1970. Mm-hmm. Highly recommend watching that. Um, yeah. It's called, uh, what's, oh, it's called Th- Woodstock. Three Days of Peace, Music, and Love. <laughs> yes. And uh we'll we'll refer back to it. There's some there's some interesting stuff that happens with that mm-hmm. later on. Uh but like let's just talk about how this even started, how this concept became yeah. reality. Um so in early 1969, a couple of uh young entrepreneurs from New York, actually this might have even been at towards the end of 1968. This this mm. started germinating. Okay. Um so a couple of young entrepreneurs named John Roberts and Joel Rosenman decided they wanted to do something fun with their monies. Oh. Make more money with the money they had. Uh-huh. Um, and Roberts was an heir to a pharmaceutical fortune. So unlike Billy McFarland, they actually had money to do this thing. <laughs> so that's the first way this is different from Firefest. They didn't they have had... to build a pyramid scheme to like... Right. Yeah. That's yeah, good. They, yeah, and they didn't have to hit up, like, people and lie about all the things they were doing. Yeah. Um, just some of the things. Just some of the things. <laughs> <laughs> they, like, put out – they literally put out an ad in the New York Times that said, young men with unlimited capital looking for interesting, legitimate investment opportunities and business propositions. <laughs> and that's how they met uh, the two other organizers who started thinking about this whole – Festival, uh, Artie Kornfeld and Mike Lang. Artie so, Kornfeld, what a name! Woof, Artie. Oh. Artie Kornfeld. It's like a lot of weird, hard sounds in that name. Yeah. Uh, anytime corn is in your name, it's like, all right, okay, yeah, all right, corn. <laughs> also, they would end up having it in a cornfield, Mister Kornfeld. So, oh. wow, you're in the right place. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so they all got together, these four dudes, and they're the oldest of out of all of them was like 27 years old. So like 
a bunch of like oh 20 God. year old 20 something year old dudes were like we have so much money let's like do a fucking cool thing dude <laughs> but Bruh, I, man. I feel like 27 back then was like was older and more mature Sure, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, 27 now is, like, you're still... I feel like people are still babies and don't know how to do anything for themselves. I mean, I don't know. I feel like I had my shit together at 27. No, Just me kidding. too. No, I did. No, we <laughs> no. did. We did. Uh, I mean, no. Like, I, I, it just kind of depends. But, like, yeah. these guys... Well, the one guy had money from being an heir of a pharmaceutical company. He true. didn't, like, make that money. So. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow. Yeah, they were maybe a little bit more mature, but who knows? Who knows, um, yeah. So, Kornfeld and Lang, these two dudes that, like, jumped in and were like, let's do this thing all together, they proposed originally building uh, a recording studio and retreat for rock musicians up in Woodstock, New York. Uh, it was already kind of like this, like, artist retreat like in the I think the Catskills right uh, um I'm pretty sure I don't know <laughs> uh <laughs> somebody correct me if I'm wrong but I'm pretty sure that's what it is we'll double check that and cut it out if we need to <laughs> yeah um <laughs> so it was already it was like kind of like you know how Joshua Tree has become like an artist retreat yeah. it's like out in the middle of nowhere very quiet bucolic place to just kick back and relax yeah uh especially when you're like a super famous person you just like need a place to get the fuck away from everybody yeah um so like a bunch of musicians had moved there and they figured all right well like let's do this thing and and if you build it they will come kind of or they're already there but more maybe more will come and want to hang out at our studio uh like bob dylan for example lived in woodstock and was right there and they were they were like he'll totally be into this um But it, the idea for doing that actually morphed into creating a two-day rock concert for 50,000 people uh, with the hope that the concert would raise enough money to pay for the studio. Oh. So this is how it's like the Fire Festival. <gasps> they thought that by putting on this this event, they would make money to pay for this other thing. Oh. Just like the Fire Festival guys put on the festival to promote the app that they were building. Mm-hmm. Um which didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. No, none of it worked out. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That's weird. Yeah. Um, but also like the fire Festival, things went very sideways in terms of uh, just all the the planning and uh, everything just gets much harder when you decide to do a, a mass scale thing. Yeah. Okay. Because it's like, I get it. You want to do something stunty. To promote yeah. whatever it is you're doing. like, But does it need to be this giant festival that actually takes a lot of planning and infrastructure and stuff? Like, no, you should pro- probably just do something a little more low-key, not out in the middle of nowhere. Yep. But yeah. they want to do. Well, and that's kind of how the idea started. So they all kind of agreed that, yes, this will be fucking rad. Let's do it. Um, they set da- the dates for August 15th through 18th of 1969 uh, and started selling tickets through mail order uh, and at select stores. So the price then was $7 for one day, $13 for two days, and $18 for three days. A fucking steal. Dude. I know. Well, I mean, like, today's money, that's probably, like... What it costs to go to Coachella. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, No, not quite. I feel like it's, like, 40, 50, 60 bucks, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. So... They started booking vendors, they, you know, contractors to build the stage and other infrastructure, hiring security, uh, booking food vendors, and then they started, you know, getting bands eventually. Um, And the way this kind of all got rolling, because, like, you can book all the vendors you want and, like, spend money, but, like, you got to get bands on board to actually have a event so (laughs) they were working really hard to get some talent involved and they weren't having too much success and they finally got Creedence Clearwater Revival to sign on and once CCR signs on everybody else kind of gets on board too all the other acts that they wanted so it was cool so they got a lot of good acts on board they had all their vendors were flowing they were doing all the right things yeah 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 
They weren't putting too too many carts before the horse, like they had secured a location in in Woodstock. Uh, And then things went off the rails. Um, So this is around April. They had signed CCR. So through the spring of of, uh, 1969, they were really working hard on getting everything organized, uh, getting their lineup secure, all that. But then they lost their location, their first location. And then they tried to move to another location in Wallkill, New York, which is a little a little bit further away from Woodstock than they would have liked, but they had to do something. Um, and it was like an industrial park, so there was mm. plenty of room. And they thought they had that place secure. And then the people of Wallkill were like, absolutely fucking not. <gasps> Get the fuck out, you dirty hippies. We hate you. Rude. rude. Oh. So rude. Oh. I know. Can you believe? Oh, my God. They just so, want to, like, come listen to music and, like, smoke pot. Yeah. Ugh. Like, what's the big deal? Calm down. It's an industrial park. Like, everybody's just going to chill and listen to music. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but these people were uptight jerks, man. <laughs> <laughs> and they... The, the town of Wallkill literally passed a law on July 2nd, 1969, that effectively banned the concert from their vicinity. <gasps> like, get the fuck out completely. Excuse me. So rude. Oh, my God. S- someone needs to take a bubble bath. <laughs> a bubble bath. <laughs> Relax, mom and dad. Uh, God. Uh, God. Take a chill pill, man. So they, so that July 2nd, is only a month and a half before <gasps> August 15th. <laughs> oh, my God. Which is like, oh, so they had all the bands, all the vendors, like everybody's like willing to do this thing and they have nowhere to do it. Yeah. Oh, my God. Just like Fire Festival. <laughs> if you guys re- if you guys are familiar, if you've watched the docs on uh, Fire Festival, they had planned to do it on a private island that was like the whole draw of the whole entire thing Mm -hmm. and it was like pablo escobar's private island that he used to traffic drugs through (laughs) and the family said please do not like that the pablo escobar's family who sold the island to this stupid idiot billy mcfarland the organizer of fire festival they were like please do not mention anything about pablo escobar the very first fucking thing they do in their promo video is say pablo escobar's former (laughs) island (laughs) so that they lost the island and they had to move it to another island that uh, was like not at all private, and uh, it's just a regular island in the Bahamas. Yeah, with like and, an airport uh, and shit. Yeah, and this is like kind of like the same thing that happened at Woodstock, sort of, but not quite. Uh, at least for Woodstock, they had the entire area of upstate New York to look at. <laughs> <laughs> and anywhere else that is connected by a series of highways to that area. <laughs> That's right. Um, but also not a lot of time to figure that out. Yeah. So they're scrambling and they miraculously link up with um, this old dude named Max Yasker, mm-hmm. who owns an al- alfalfa farm. It's a uh, 600 acres of land, mm-hmm. which is good. Yeah, That's, that's good. a lot. That's a lot of land. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's not anywhere near Woodstock. I mean, it's near, but not quite. (laughs) Yeah. It's not Woodstock. It's Bethel. Bethel, New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're saved sort of, Mm -hmm. they have a location now. Uh, thank God. Cause they are still booking bands. They're still booking vendors. They're selling tickets. Dude. Uh, they never stop selling tickets. It's crazy. Dude, they, but they lied to this guy, which they were like, okay, we need, we have $75,000 for you to lease your 600 acres of land. Um, and we're going to have 50,000 people. And the guy was like, all right, deal. Like they, they did it. It's fine. But yep. they knew at that point they'd already sold 150,000 tickets so Oops. that's a hundred thousand more than fifty, if we can all do math. <laughs> uh, and they were still planning on selling an additional hundred thousand tickets. Uh, now this is like I, <laughs> this is where I'm like, okay, I I'm not too mad about this because. I think in their mind, they're like, God, our generation's very flaky. Like, I bet not everybody's oh. going to show up. Like, 
Uh, I think a lot of people are already asking for refunds too because like they heard about um, their issues with trying to lock down a location. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, but, but on the other hand, it's also like the era of the commune and people just like hitching rides with people across the country. So it's like, could go either way. Yeah. One ticket could also be for not one person, but 10 people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A whole like VW bus full of people. <laughs> yeah. They're like, well, we have one ticket. Can that just like yeah. get us all in? <laughs> Um, <laughs> but like we're one family. We are. We are. We are one. <laughs> we are two. Oh together. yeah. We, we are, are three. three. <laughs> so then we are four. Each other. <laughs> uh, yes, we're gonna be touring. Oh, P.S. It's the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. Oh, yeah, you guys, this year it's the 50th yeah. anniversary. So Crazy. It's like uber relevant. Um, Very relevant. Um, also, the 50th anniversary falls on my wedding anniversary. Oh, my God. August 15th. <laughs> so much to celebrate. <laughs> uh, so much to celebrate. Uh, I'm going to just listen to Woodstock music all day on my anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> DJ's going to be like, cool. Maybe all you right. guys should go skinny dipping somewhere and like Ooh. do weird Woodstock things. Not weird, but you know, out of the norm. Just drop acid and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like rolling mud and shit. Yeah. All right. I'm like down. a mud slip and slide. Hell, or just like go to a mud bath at a spa and listen to some CCR. Oh, there we go. There we yeah, go. Yeah, That's yeah. more my speed. All right. Cool. Um. So yeah. So they're in Bethel, New York, which is 60 miles away from Woodstock, technically. <laughs> uh, it'd be like if Coachella was actually held in Beaumont, California. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's from Southern California. That might be funny. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know how far it is. Also, Beaumont isn't like the most fun place. No, it's not. It's <laughs> no. just like. It's, it's like a truck stop on the way to Palm Springs. <laughs> yeah. It's like a bedroom community kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of. I don't know. People live there. It's fucking <laughs> Southern California. The sprawl is real. Um, so the people of Bethel were not psyched about the venue being in their backyard. Um, and they like were pissed at, uh, Max Yasger for agreeing to host the festival. Um, so things are not great, like tension wise within the, the, the town, but I mean, shit's going, it's just going to happen whether they like it or not. They yeah. couldn't, they couldn't pass a law like, uh, whatchamacallit wall kill did uh they couldn't really do anything about it it was just gonna happen so it was too close now at this point the wheels were yeah. turning yeah and like bureaucracy was not gonna catch up to that so yeah, yeah. uh but they they had a place but now they had to really fucking hustle and get all the infrastructure put together uh they had to build a stage they had to you know make sure that the everything was secure that they had toilets they all this stuff all the practical stuff mm -hmm. if i mean before i learned about all this i just assumed that it was just literally a field and that was it you know me too yeah i thought people stage. i thought people just like brought some camping stuff and it was and everyone like had to fend for themselves but there was like actual like they had porta potties that they had serviced every day or multiple mm -hmm. times a day and like because there were so many people there and they had food vendors and they had first aid stations and like they had sh their shit together yeah they did i mean to a degree yeah yeah uh so unfortunately though only a month before a festival to get all your shit together just it, it's not gonna happen so yeah. they had to like make a lot of uh decisions about what they wanted to focus their time and money on uh, so the stage was one of the main priorities and that took a lot of manpower cause that stage was like monolithic. It was yeah, yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, Probably and it too was, big. Honestly, it could have been a bit smaller. Yeah. But like, they also wanted to, they knew it was going to be a pretty big crowd. So they wanted to like yeah. make sure that the sound was good and everybody could hear that were like mm -hmm. a mile away or whatever. So, um, I don't know. I'm pretty impressed that they got as much shit done as they did. It was, Same. uh, it was pretty, pretty intense. So mm -hmm. they also built a, um, performers pavilion where like all the people that were, all the talent could hang out and be, you know, 
kept away from the masses. Mm-hmm. Uh, they built parking lots, concession stands, even a children's playground. So wow, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, um, and uh, truly, none of the setbacks were 100 percent their fault. Like they they tried to do everything they could to do everything above board. Like they had uh, they had lawyers, they had all the all the pe- all the right people on board to help them facilitate all this stuff happening. And, you know, they had permits and they had contractors and everything they needed. But everybody was just, like, so resistant that they stood in their way at every every turn. Yeah. So. Um, and one of the things that happened when Wallkill w- was being really shitty mm-hmm. and banning them, like, the press picked that up. So that kind of uh, set them up for a lot of coverage of like yeah. a lot of press around yeah. this event. Um, so people were like, Oh, fuck that. Fuck these squares. Let's, let's go, let's go to this thing. This sounds so cool. So oh. when Wallkill did that, it kind of, uh, gave them uh, any, any press. press is, any press is a good press. So yeah. they instantly had more attention and people started buying more and more tickets. Um, all these people heard about it and it just like got kind of out of control and they didn't really realize, I don't think how much more it got out of, like how much more the word had gotten out. Like they knew it was buzzing, but they did not know how hard it was buzzing. (laughs) Dude. It's so weird to me, but it totally makes sense in terms of like the mentality of these people and wanting to be like inclusive and you know, everyone can come here and like, yeah, you know, but it's like, okay, sell the amount of tickets that like you can comfortably, you know, accommodate. Yeah. Yeah, Which they definitely didn't. They just like kept selling more tickets and it's like, okay. Yeah. And then also not their fault, but people just showed up. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so even like like so the the festival was supposed to happen the like I said the 15th which was uh what Friday? Yeah. Uh so it'd be Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh-huh. Um but Wednesday before the festival weekend started, tens of thousands of people started flowing <laughs> into the town. Like it was like an invasion, just like oh, all these God. hippies coming out of the woodwork into this teeny little corner of upstate New York. Uh, and they invade this town, uh, and they just start coming on the property because, like like I said, they had to focus on building the stage Mm -hmm. and focusing the, the labor on, on that and all the other things that they found to be a priority. Uh, so they didn't build fences around the property. Oh my God. So... And, I mean, they had, like, chain link up in places, but it was just not enough. Yeah. Uh, to contain people that were just coming from all directions. Well, and they didn't have, like, enough people working and to, like, set up even, like, security checkpoints or, you know, like, they didn't, yeah. they didn't think about how the flow of people would come in and where they would need to, like, cut people off and stuff like that. Exactly. And it was just, like, a flood of people. And it was, like... A lot of people all at once. It wasn't Dude. just like a couple people crawling in. It was like tens of thousands of people. Um, so people were driving, obviously, up up to up to upstate, up to this small little country town, mm-hmm. and um, they're realizing pretty quickly, like, oh fuck! Like all the organizers were like, oh fuck! This is uh, this is fucked up. We did not anticipate that it would be like this. Um, they. They still, I think, in their minds thought it'd be, like, a, around 50,000 people. But that number was surpassed, like, immediately. Like, with before the festival even started, oh there was already God. more than 50,000 people just on this farm. Um, so they upped the estimate to 200,000 people and were trying to, like, adjust and hire more people and more vendors and food and all that. And uh, then they realized, oh, we we're fucked. They're... There's way more than 200,000 people that are coming because then they started hearing that people were just driving and getting stuck on the roads and, like, walking in. So they just had no idea what was going to happen. It's oh crazy. God. Think about that because there's no social media. There's yeah, no yeah. – they're, they're getting all of their uh, 
information from the from news, you know, newspapers, news coverage, uh, radio, whatever, and some of it's accurate, some of it's not. And then like people like on the outside are coming in telling them what's happening, and it's just like, who knows? It's all piecemeal, so they're kind of in the dark. Dude, it is. It is, like, the craziest, yeah, to think that there wasn't social media and somehow, uh-huh. at, at the highest point, it was, like, 500,000 people, right, that weekend? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Somehow, 500,000 people in 1969. Half a million people. What, found their ways to this festival and just, like, just abandoned their cars on the side of the road, on the side of the highway, and walked in on foot because they couldn't drive in. Yeah, and they were like, get there. They were stranded like miles out too. Miles, yeah, miles. People abandoned their cars and just walked for yeah. miles to get there. Crazy, dude. Um, I I can't even imagine what that must have looked like. Uh, and I I'd be afraid to like leave my car and shit. I don't know. Watching this documentary, I was, like, very anxious. Yeah. There were so many people. Because you see, like, helicopter footage of this festival. It's fucking insane. Like, yeah. you, it, you just never see that many people, I feel like. I mean, yeah. you rarely see that many people out in the middle of nowhere. Right, right, right. Um, Like, aside from, like, uh, you know, Mecca pil- pilgrimages and, like, other things – like religious pilgrimages, stuff like that. Um, there was not really ever a gathering of human beings this large. So Dude. it was just beyond all of their expectations. And they were like, okay, what do we do? We got to figure it out. Uh, so they just, once they realized like how fucked they were, they just were like, and knew they couldn't stop all the people from coming. They were just like, they they said okay the concert's free, and this is when they still thought it was like, you know maybe two hundred thousand people were gonna come. Dude, they 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 got on the stage and said all right the concert's free I guess, and people found out about this yeah. and more people started coming. It's estimated over a million people tried to get there and oh only half a million actually made it. <gasps> So, fuck. Because, like, are you willing to walk 13 miles to get to, like, dude, yeah. could you imagine, though, like, oh, I'd love to talk to someone who, like, tried to get there but gave up? Yeah. Because, like, wow, to miss that, to be so close to that and then to yeah. miss it? Yeah. That would suck. Yeah. Oh, my God. FOMO, for sure. Woo. Yeah, before it was even a thing. Yeah. People were like, I can't miss out on this. I gotta go. <laughs> Oh, my God. It's just, like, one long trail of Volkswagen buses and, like, fucking, I don't know. Patchouli oil. (laughs) (laughs) If you can smell patchouli oil, go the other way because that's – they're all headed to Turn around. Don't drown. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Uh, But, like – Oh, but there wasn't even room to to house all these people. No. There was, like – I mean – they were crammed in on the field, like yeah. on the, on the farm. Yeah. Ugh. So people just started camping in other people's backyards, like big farm backyards, because this was like a farm town. So yeah. they were just like finding land that like looked like unoccupied, but was like actually part of people's like farmland. Yeah. And they yeah. were just setting up camps there. Awful. Yeah. I mean, awful for the people that had to deal with like all the the neighboring farmers and shit and people who were like, oh, I don't think this is what I signed up for. Yeah. I knew it was going to be a problem, but holy fucking shit. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So that's that was the setup, man. They really just it it they built it. And boy, did people come. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the festival itself, though. Oh wow. What yeah. a lineup. What? How? Like. The fact that all these bands were together at the same time is mind blowing. It's so fucking cool. Yeah, so all these fucking great bands and even some of the bands at the time they they weren't well known at the time but because of Woodstock they became more well known. Mhm. Like for example Crosby Stills Nash and Young, mm-hmm. they were not they were not uh, known. They were they, they were a super group. Uh so, right, cuz they had all been in other bands. Yeah, Before. so this is, like, only the second time they're performing together. Holy shit. Like, as a band. 
Dude. Isn't that cool? That's so cool. Oh my God. <laughs> like who's who of fucking hippie ass bands? Dude. All all the bands that were popular at the time. The Who. Mm-hmm. Joe Cocker, which... Oh, that, one of the best performances oh. of all time of A Little Help for My Friends. Oh my God. That performance. I just have full body chills right now even just thinking about it his voice is crazy it's like so screamy but like but the tone is so nice yeah 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 it's It's weird yeah it's so cool um Joan Baez was there she was six months pregnant at the time and her husband was in jail for (gasps) protesting the Vietnam War for like actively trying to get out of the draft Oh, my God. Like, he was drafted and supposed to, like, go, and he was like, no, fuck you, and they, like, put him in jail. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, and, like, she gets on stage, and she's like, I just want you all to know her, her husband's name was David. David's okay, and, like, started telling, like, the crowd about, like, where he, like, had been transferred to, like, federal prison or whatever. How crazy is that? Oh, my God. Yeah, and then she famously performed, like, the end of her set in a downpour. Yeah. Six months pregnant. Pretty fucking cool. Badass bitch. With the voice Bad of bitch. an angel. Oh, her voice. It's so Ooh. good. It doesn't look like that's what would come out of her face. I know. <laughs> <laughs> out of her face hole. <laughs> out of her face hole. Uh, Janis Joplin. Uh, legend. What a ledge. Um, whoever sings this song. I'm gone to the country. Why would you want to Can't he? Go? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pete hates that song so much. It was like the DJ, first song in the doc. I know. DJ always sings that song to Jack and like makes up words. He always says, Go on up the country, go on to Mexico. <laughs> like that's not what it says. Uh, how does he uh, sing? What? What? Go ahead. How does he sing like that? It's like, Hop, go. Wait. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going up the country, where do you want to go? Oh, I don't know. Is that going right? Going up the country, going to me. Oh, I don't know, I don't know what the <laughs> lyrics are. I'm just singing the going DJ to lyrics. Mexico. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. It's a weird, it's well, a weird voice. Pete went down a rabbit hole last night and also discovered that that's like stolen from a blues song. It's like appropriated. Of course, of course it is. Yeah. A, a lot of music is, which is very unfortunate. But that's why we Led need Zeppelin. to rec- <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we have to recognize it, call it out. That's right. Um, but yeah, uh, he he was like, "Oh, I hate the song even more now." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, it's interesting. Yeah, um, a little jazz flute in there. You oh know. yeah, yeah. I actually kind of like it. I like the jazz. I like yeah, the yeah, flute. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Santana. Okay. Mm-hmm. Soul Sacrifice, his performance of Soul Sacrifice is one of my all-time favorite that, performances. That was in the documentary, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Dude. It's fucking great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It's so good. He's a baby. I was it's like... It's crazy. Uh, he, and his drummer was a baby. His drummer, I was like, that kid is a teenager. And Pete Googled it, and the kid was like 20 years old. But He was the youngest person to perform at Woodstock. Who? The his drummer? drummer. <gasps> yeah. No way. Uh, you mm-hmm. look at him and you're like, that's a child. Like, that's a child. He, he yeah. wasn't a child. He was 20. No, but, but 20, you know, yeah. you look at him and you're like, whoa, that is yeah. crazy. And he's just like going Wailing. And he's psyched. Oh, my oh God. My he's God. like so you, you could tell he's just like yeah. living in the moment. And it's so good. So I love all these performances because I used to have like the 25th anniversary <gasps> box set. Oh. Um, and I was thinking about it and I was like, okay, I was gifted that on the 25th, like around the 25th anniversary of Woodstock. Now mm. we are 25 years away from that point in time <gasps> from when I got that box set. Fuck, I feel old. Oh, yeah, that's old. Yeah. But you were 10. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, was, yeah. Yeah. Was I? That well, no, I mean, at the time, I think it was like 13. It'd been out for a couple of years. Oh, so. But okay. still, yeah, but still. still. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. that's wild. Yeah. Oh, God. So, uh, who else was performing? I mean, so many good performances. Oh, my God. So many good performances. Just Sly and the Family Zone. Yes. Jefferson Airplane, which uh. her voice is magic. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Grateful Dead, which apparently it was an awful performance and like, like, literally one of their worst everyone and they admit it yeah and they admit it like 
everyone was there and high on drugs and still nobody had anything nice to say about it. <laughs> like they were like, it was, they're, like, they're like, oh, like you it really harsh my buzz, man. <laughs> yeah. They're like, I'm fucking sober now. Thanks, Grateful Dead. <laughs> Do you know that DJ met Jerry Garcia once? No, what? Where? Cool? Uh, I think somewhere in Oregon, obviously. Weird. Oh, yeah. that is cool. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I read that. I was like, that's very funny that they just yeah. like totally <laughs> biffed it at Woodstock. It's like yeah, the quintessential concert of the time. Like everyone yeah. was just like. Holy shit. I mean, like, Jimi Hendrix was there and had, like, his quintessential performance uh, <laughs> that he would, like, be known for for the rest of his, you know, legend. Like, however long that's going to exist. And then fucking Grateful Dead's just, like, might as well have not been there. That would have been better than them being Seriously. there. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it would have been so much better. Uh, uh. Yeah. yeah, who else? Oh, well, of course, Creedence Clearwater Revival. Yeah. Uh, and of course, I mean, and yeah. so many others, but of course, last but not least. Yeah, Jimi Hendrix. Oh, my Jimi God. Hendrix. But like, okay, this is crazy. So like, he played on Monday morning. So the festival was supposed to end Sunday, but it was such a shit show. And there were so many delays with the acts because they had to be like helicoptered in because all the oh, yeah. roads were yeah. like. Didn't shut mention down. that. Meant to, meant to mention that. Yeah. Yeah, they, they had, were like they had to like enlist the local air force base to help them helicopter in a talent. lot of the talent. Yeah, yeah crazy. It's crazy. But so by the time Jimi Hendrix went on, also he, he it was in his rider like with the festival that no one could perform after him. So mm-hmm. he kind of like did it to himself a little bit. But also you played yourself, man. You played yourself, <laughs> but also he went on stage eight thirty a.m. on a fucking Monday, dude. And just brought the house down. And, like, tons of people had already left by then because it was a shit show. And also, it was supposed to be over. People had to get back to work and stuff. Yeah. (laughs) For as irresponsible as all these fucking hippies were, they are like, oh, Monday, gotta go. (laughs) Gotta go. I uh, I have my job now. I gotta put on a tie. Um, Yeah. But still, he slayed. And for anyone who stayed was, like, they were definitely treated to (sighs) one of the biggest moments in, like, rock history, which... It's crazy to me. Watching that video of his Ugh. performance, like, you are just like, this This wasn't even, like, a man. He was, like, a superhuman yeah. performer. And just, like, yeah. it's he makes it look so effortless. You, Everyone should definitely watch it. It's so good. Also, I just fucking love Jimi Hendrix. I mean, and he was one of the best guitar players in of, all of human history. Oh, my God. So. And will be. And will <laughs> yeah. continue to be. Like, people still don't come close, I feel like. No. Yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah. So one of the main reasons uh, a lot of the acts were delayed or, like, the whole – festival really was delayed was because there was a huge rainstorm <laughs> um i think it started raining on it, friday night or saturday i think friday but it, it like had rained a little bit before they got there mm-hmm. and then again friday like when the festival started it started raining uh that day so yeah. like day one it's, it's raining and it's a yeah. fucking mud mess it's just like all the things that could go wrong went wrong Dude. Just like Fire Festival, but somehow <sighs> it still all fucking worked. Um, so the rainstorm actually made everything really disgusting and gross. Obviously, it was just like <laughs> muddy as shit. But it also made it really dangerous for the performers to perform. Like some people were getting like electrocuted <gasps> because for as much as the work they put into the stage, like they couldn't make it completely perfect and like ground all the electrical as good as it needed to like yeah. there's a bunch of fucking you watch the documentary and you're literally these guys are all smoking like joints and drinking beers like hammering away like it's crazy like it, <laughs> it is yeah and also just shirtless fucking hippies <laughs> with joints like building a stage and you're like wow this stage is fucking huge and they just did it all fucking stoned and drunk <laughs> oh my god but it worked i mean it i'm did. i'm shocked that that and the um, lighting and sound towers that they build, mm-hmm. you know, like out from they they build them out in the audience to like yeah. face onto the stage to like light it and stuff, and so that there's sound out far. Yeah, uh, 
those things, even you look at that and I'm like, dude, that for sure looks like something I made with toothpicks in it, it, but it fucking worked, dude. It worked, and also they would scream at the people because people were climbing those towers trying to get a better view, and they were like, "Dude, do get off the towers, get off!" And people listened, and I was like, "And Good. they, and they did like uh all the daily like PSAs." Like <laughs> I didn't know those were real. Okay, I want to yes, talk dude. about that because yes, in Wayne's world, they're like, "There's some bad acid," or no, they're like, "There's there's some bad licorice." Rope circulating. Yeah, yeah. Be careful. Don't eat the licorice rope or whatever. But that was real. They, they're they like, there's some bad brown acid circulating. And he's like, the guy's like, listen, you know, it's probably, it's not up to me to tell you what to do. Yeah. But just so you know, the brown acid is not great. <laughs> it's just Dude. Like, and it was like. So fucking funny. Mary Catherine, your dad called. Yeah. It's legit like fucking a morning announcements. It's like, yeah. yeah. Uh, also. You're, yeah. Call Go to the, you know, motor in and call your father. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's like, yeah. Uh, uh, Steven, your dad wants you to know that he's rented a room down in uh, wherever, somewhere else in New York. It's like a small town on the way to this, yeah. to Bethel. Um, he's in room 102 at the motel in this town. Uh, he wants to know if you're okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like all these, P- like all the morning announcements. It's so funny. Like, like John Smith, your friends are up towards the left side of the stage. Like It's like fucking amazing. Just amazing. Oh, so good. Yeah. So. All that shit happened. It was the fucking rain was gnarly. The mud was just, I mean, everybody's seen pictures of people just covered in mud. Yeah. Like all these goddamn idiots, like just woman in mud. And you're like, ooh. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> you know, there was some definite shit mixed in there. Dude, manure at least, but at also least. people shit maybe. Probably. Um, and old hot dogs and stuff. Just like whatever is like garbage on the ground. I don't yeah, know. definitely. Um. So it started out like very communal and fun, it seems like, and everybody's like doing acid and uh, having a great time. Uh, But then I would say after a day and a half of being inundated with rain, people were probably like, fuck this. Yeah. I think. (laughs) And like having a bad acid trip just doesn't work well. Yeah. Um, Also, Shit started going even more sideways because they ran out of food on the second day. Dude. Yeah, it was, uh, I think, like, they had locked down vendors, but they weren't, like, super experienced, I don't think. Nobody really, because people didn't want a lot to do with this festival. Yeah, of course. Uh, but So also, anybody, like, legitimate was not really on board. Yeah. Ex- I mean, certain people were pretty legit, but, like, the vendor, like, the food vendor was definitely not. Yeah, and also, how do you plan when you're given the wrong number? You can't plan to feed however many people if they're not telling you who's actually coming. Right, yeah, exactly. There's just no way to, no way to, to do it. Uh, yeah. It just, it got real gnarly. Dude. Yeah. Uh, well, I thought it was funny, too, because hot dogs were 25 cents on the first day, but then they were like, oh, shit, there's a lot of people here, and the vendors were like, we could make more money. So then they're like, we're going to raise hot dogs to a dollar. Rude. Rude. And the hippies didn't take too kindly, and they burned down. <laughs> they burned the fucking... They burned their food tent, tent. down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fucking capitalist, man. Yeah, they're like, fuck you, man. We... You sell us hot dogs at a fair price or we'll fuck with your shit, man. Yeah. <laughs> and then they did. And- <laughs> so, yeah. So things are trending poorly. Uh, oh, my and God. They, like, they had to, like, helicopter in supplies. They they were trying everything they could. Still better than Fire Festival <laughs> than a lo- by a long shot, guys. At least the bands were there. Like, no one really had, like, a, a good area to sleep. But people could sleep in their cars and stuff, at least. Or they could leave yeah. if they wanted to. They weren't trapped on a fucking 
Bahamian all, island. But not really because, okay, and this is how it kind of is similar is because it became an island. That's true. Because of all the all the roadways being clogged. Like, yeah. Once you got there, it was like, yeah, you could walk out, but it's like, try doing that after two days of acid. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think you can. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't know, but yeah, probably not. Yeah. So, or, or is it a, the funnest walk you've ever been on? Could be. You could really find yourself. <laughs> you find the meaning of life, mm-hmm. maybe. But I don't know. You might not find your car because yeah. we don't know where it is. Yeah. Don't do it in the dark. <laughs> uh, so as you can imagine, by Sunday, things were incredibly dire. Uh, the morning, that Sunday morning, the governor of, at the time, Nelson Rockefeller, uh, called John Roberts, one of the main fest- festival organizers, and told him he was thinking about ordering 10,000 New York State National Guard troops to kind of calm down the festival. Um, he, Roberts, was successful in, in you know, getting him, talking him out of that, because that would have, I feel like, bad. really, really been bad. Yeah. What would they have done? Like, if they're not bringing in supplies, they're just coming to be, a, a, like, uh, Oppressive an opposition. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to yeah. the people and what they're doing. So it's, like, not helpful. Yeah. So they, uh, they like I said, they... They needed help, though. So uh, Sullivan County, which I guess is the county that uh, Bethel's in, declared a state of emergency. And I, I guess the U.S. Army did eventually have to get involved and bring food, water, and more medics uh, via helicopter. Wow. So crazy. Oh, my God. So that, I mean, it sounded like any other fe- – I mean, I've been to a few festivals, and it's always there's always something that's a shit show, no matter how well – uh, organized and prepared you can be. There's always going to be people getting hurt or getting fucked up on drugs or whatever. But hopefully there's more than one porta potty for every 833 people. Ooh! Ooh, that's a doo-doo mountain! You're sitting on top of a doo-doo mountain! You're the king! <laughs> yeah, woof. <laughs> so, yeah, there was uh, a lot of people... Got hurt. A lot of people had bad acid trips. Dude. What are some of the numbers, man? Just run down. Okay, 797 bad trips. That's Oof. 700 too many. Yeah. Uh, 23 epileptic seizures. That's just n- numbers. I mean, people... I mean, st- st- statistically, yeah. like, it's going to happen. Yeah, people there probably have epilepsy and that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, 57 cases of heat exposure. There was a lot of sunburned white people. Yep. 176 asthma attacks. 938 foot lacerations. Yeah, because there was just like garbage everywhere. And, and I mud. mean, this was not a, this was not a, uh, environmentally friendly festival. <laughs> there no. were people, people didn't understand what the fuck was happening and they just were like, open up their beer and throw their, the pop top on the ground and that's how people slice their oh, feet open. fuck that. No way. Well, and like, they're all hippies not wearing shoes. Yep. Hate to make Ugh. a generalization, but that's what happens. Um, 135 foot punctures. I guess that's different than a laceration. Also, 346 random other foot injuries. So not a punctuation, not a laceration. It's an other. A stub toe, perhaps. Yeah. A rolled ankle. You drop your bong on your foot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, um, and then CNN reported that a woman also fell from stage scaffolding and broke her back. Well, what was she doing up there? They told you to get down. You know, yeah. you need to well, follow. CNN wasn't around then. So this is like after the fact. Oh, must have been. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But also two people died, which is very sad, but also like seems very low. Dude. Statistically, this is crazy. Go on. Um, especially since there was so much, so many drugs, so much chaos, and definitely not enough like medical professional support to take care of all these people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like a 17 year old boy, his name is Raymond Mizak. He was run over by a sewage tractor. Oh, the porta potty tractor. Like, ugh, it's just the worst way to go. Oh and it's God. so sad because he was, um, so because it rained, people were trying to, like, figure out any kind of way to, like, stay out of the rain. And he 
was under a sleeping bag, sleeping in a field, and he got run over by the tractor because like the tractor couldn't see him. Yeah, because he was in like it was like kind of a pile of a bunch of like wet sleeping bags. It looked like trash, yeah. I think. I yeah, and everything was covered with mud, so yeah. it was like he was not not visible. Oh. Um, so sad. That oh, is really poor bad. guy. Yeah. Oh, it's the worst way to go. Yeah. Yeah, the other death was eighteen-year-old Marine Richard Beeler, who. Apparently, I don't know if all this information is true, but he was scheduled to leave for Vietnam, but he went to the festival first um, or while he was on home or or while he was home on leave, I should say. Uh, So people say that he died of a heroin overdose, but uh, some people think he might have died from myocarditis, which is caused by hyperthermia, which is the opposite of hyperthermia. Uh, which might have been triggered by an adverse reaction to a drug such as LSD or methamphetamine. Oh, God. Um, and yet another possibility is that he might have developed the hyperthermia as a, re- as a side effect of Thorazine, which is a commonly administered uh, drug to treat a bad LSD trip. Oh. So that is a side effect of that drug. So, oh, God. Yeah. Either way, it was drug Either way. related. He was just yeah, trying to yeah, have yeah. a good time before he like went and died overseas probably. Yeah, That's seriously. So sad. Um, <sighs> yeah, so those are all, that was all the bad stuff that happened. That is miraculous. Yeah, not a lot. I mean, it, it, all in all, it wasn't, it could have been so much worse, but I think the type of people that were there and like what they stood for and the vibe at the festival mm-hmm. like really helped. You could not have something like that these days and have it go that well, I feel like. No. Right? I mean, Absolutely not. I don't, I, I've been, I, I've been to, um, I've been to Coachella and I literally watched somebody like fall off of a thing that they weren't supposed to climb on. Oh my God. And it was like, there was security everywhere, you know, yeah, like there yeah. was, it was like well controlled and like he fucking fell and like broke his leg or some shit. Oh I don't God. know. Oh my God. Oh my God. So. And you just see fights and stuff and. Oh. And there's fights and there was none of that here. Yeah. Yeah. People Except were- for the hot dog tent. <laughs> well, they deserved it, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, this whole thing, I just can't, I still can't get over that it was not more of a shit show, mm-hmm. uh, even though it was definitely a shit show. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. So, the guys that ran the festival, they had, they spent a lot of money on this shit. And they got into debt, obviously, because. <laughs> Dude. Well, because at the end, you know, they were having to, like, pay out of pocket for, like, helicopters to bring talent in. They were having to pay to bring new food vendors in because people were running out of food. So yeah. I think they uh, they were, like, by the time all of this was done, they had lost $1.3 million. Yeah, the whole thing cost uh, $3.1 million, which Jeez. is around $15 million in today's dollars. Oh, my God. Uh, and that's their own money. And... Uh, Actually, they got a loan at the last minute, which is like a whole other story. But <laughs> geez, you. yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of fucking money, and they Dude. like and and they were in the hole big time. Uh, oh my God. But one of the things that they did that was so fucking smart and and very modern. Uh, I like it's crazy to think that they thought of this was to film the whole fucking thing. Dude, smart. Oh, I didn't realize that that was why that they, I wondered because. I wondered why they were, like, giving so many answers and stuff to the guys. And they were, like, smoking weed on camera and, like, you know? I was like, oh, okay, so they wanted that to happen. Yeah, so it it would be, like, I don't know, like, the, the, they had not a lot of wherewithal, but this was the one area where they really had their shit together. It was almost like they were, like, they knew how important it was to uh, to ha- bear witness to all this fucking cool shit, um, regardless of what happened. I'm so, so glad they did, because yeah. honestly, watching some of that footage, it's so cool. I know. It's it's really fucking cool. So because they did this, a they were so much footage was gathered that they were able to create a full feature-length film. And I think the original footage is like... I'll even edited down as almost four hours. Oh like the God. movie's like almost four hours and it's like actually like a three hour documentary. Um, so they released the film, 
the following year in 1970. And this film went on to win the Academy Award for Best Documentary Film. Oh. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's uh, cool. Also, it was one of Martin Scorsese's very first films <gasps> that he worked on. Wow. As, as an editor, yeah. That's cool. Isn't that cool? Like, he was, like, in film school or something and was, like, or fresh out of film school. Oh, I can't remember. but that explains his connection to music. And his music's mm-hmm. always so good in all of his films. And I know, yeah. He worked yeah. on this. Yes. So, very fucking cool. Uh, and it's such a good thing that they did this because they, well, they lost a lot of money. But then they also had approximately 80 lawsuits filed against them. <gasps> Against the Woodstock Ventures, their company that they Uh formed. Um, And most of them were from the farmers in the area because all those fucking people were, like, sleeping on their property and probably did damage and shit. Um, uh, So the movie financed settlements and paid off about 1.4, like, right around however much the debt was. Wow. Um, So, yeah. And even after everything was paid off, though, they were still over 100K in debt. So, well, worth it? I don't worth know. it. And all things considered. For real, I mean. That's not that bad. And I'm sure they, they were able to make money doing other things. Yeah, so the, the film, they eventually, like, made money from it. They Well, they eventually paid off all their debts, yeah. like, a decade later, like, in the early 80s. Oh, okay. And I, I think they eventually turned a profit because they kept releasing, like, you know, anniversary yeah. cuts and all, uh, all anything like related to because they didn't have merch then but they most certainly figured out how to make merch afterwards yeah I was gonna say that was one of the things when I was like reading about this that was like such a fail they didn't have yeah. the 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 little partridge birds or whatever on the guitar yeah. that that was like the quintessential Woodstock logo and they didn't put it on anything yeah uh, they didn't think about that. They were like so focused on the whole event itself that they didn't, I don't know. But also, Maybe they did think of it, but it was just like too many other things had priority. But also that's capitalism, man, and nobody yeah. wants to buy that shit, okay? So just like leave it at home. <laughs> but you know some people could have used a goddamn dry t-shirt. <laughs> a fucking dry clean t-shirt? Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. It was really funny in the documentary watching people like bathing in nearby lakes. Just like, ew. And like other people Ugh. washing dishes right next to them. I know, I know. I'm like, oh, there's pubes so in that. Yeah. That's the least of your your worries. <laughs> I'd rather have a pube than a tapeworm. <laughs> yeah, oh, true that. True that. Uh, yeah, so I think some of the unsung heroes of Woodstock are all the first responders. Mm-hmm. They were, the concert promoters were pretty smart. Like, they did think of a lot of things that I would not have given them credit for. Mm-hmm. They hired a, uh, a, a local doctor, a local general pr- practitioner named William Abruzzi, to oversee the EMS aspect of the event. Mm. And he had a, he had experience working in large demonstrations, like civil rights uh, demonstrations. So he knew, uh, and he also knew, like, what kind of terrain he was going to be working with, like the farmland and shit. So he knew, like, what kind of issues would come up, mm. and, like twisted ankles from, like, he, he kind of just had a, a rough idea, so he was able to, like, supply and staff uh, appropriately mm. for what he thought it was going to be. Yeah. Uh, he hired 18 physicians, 36 nurses, and 27 medical assistants to work the festival in eight hour shifts over the three days. Wow. Um, they would work in trailers that had 30, 30 bed hospital tent. Um, and so there was always somebody that was on, on duty around the clock. But then when it was more than 50,000, they were like, oh, fuck, what the fuck do we do? <laughs> Luckily, though, the, um, the, the, promote, the concert promoters, they also hired 85 members of this commune known as the Hog Farm. <laughs> and uh, they, were, they were like kind of security and just like general vibe merchants milling through the place and also help the medical medical staff with like bad trips oh and they set up these trip tents uh at other festivals so they're very experienced in dealing with this shit they're like oh no someone got the brown acid hog farm coming through (laughs) yeah yeah 
So at first, like the medical staff was trying to deal with all these uh, LSD trips and they didn't really know how yeah. to deal with it. They were just like giving everybody the, um, the, uh, the th- Thorazine mm. um, instead of like talking down people. And the hog farmers were like, nah, man, don't give people that shit. It might not, it might like really adversely affect them we'll just yeah. talk them down so they all they started working in tandem and it was like very fucking cool oh my god um, yeah i would only ever want to do lsd if someone like that was around who knew right? who knew how to like talk you, you need down. a guide yeah you, you need, need like a, a, a spirit guide yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and then another unsung here i think are all the festival go- goers maybe they are not unsung like that's probably the reason that this whole thing didn't turn into a complete and total catastrophe. Yeah. Because everybody stayed very fucking chill and cool and had a good time no yeah. matter what. Um, maybe some people didn't have that great a time. But they were still, like, very positive, very nice, very respectful. And everybody got along. Everybody helped each other. It was very peace and love. Um, and some more unsung heroes, the townspeople, they put oh up with God. a lot of fucking bullshit. But a lot of them ended up helping a lot of these people, like all the concert goers, they ended up, you know, helping feed them and taking care of them to some degree uh, because they just had to. They had to. And they're decent people. And so. they, like, yeah, like handed out water and like, yeah, yeah, just was trying to make sure people weren't like starving. And because yeah. these were just young people. Yeah. And they were and all these kids were. Very nice and respectful. When you watch the documentary, yeah, the they interview some of the townspeople, and they're like, "What do you think about all this?" They're like, "You know, I don't really know what the hell is going on, but the only thing I've noticed is that everybody's very nice." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was all very positive, regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the real MVP of this whole fucking thing is Max Yasker, the guy who owned the farm. Aww. He was the sweetest man. He's just this old man. And he gave up his farm to the rock gods to help create one of the greatest moments in music history. And he's just like, if it wasn't for him, they wouldn't have had a place to hold the whole thing. It wouldn't have never happened, probably. God bless. Um, God bless. He said, um, this is a very lovely quote for him. from him. He said, "If we talking about the concert goers, if we join them, we can turn those adversities that are the problems of America today into a hope for a brighter and more peaceful future. Oh, was that what he said on stage? No, he said this after the fact, probably. Maybe like to press. I can't remember. Because he was on stage in the documentary and he was like, oh, wow, I've never talked to 20 people at once, let alone this many. And he was like, <laughs> so cute. And he was like, well, I just hope you all enjoy yourself and I like what you're about. Uh, it was Aww. just like really sweet. Like he probably realized, oh, everyone's just here to have a good time and like. You know. Even though he was like, holy shit, I thought there was only supposed to be 50,000 people. And there's yeah. literally 10 times that here now. He kept his chill, and that's why he's a hero. That's right. I like the porta potty guy who was, like, servicing the porta potties and, <laughs> and the guy uh, was like, oh, so, like, are you cool doing this? And he's like, yeah, man, my son's here. He's like, oh. I got one son here somewhere. He's having a good time. And my other son's in Vietnam. And, and he was like, you know, just do doing what I can. And he was just like such a cute dad. And I was like, oh, and he's fucking wiping down the toilets and what an angel. Yeah, just being be doing just a, a good poop job. Fairy. <laughs> yeah, he was a little, a little turd fairy. Oh, what a time! Oh, I mean, honestly, time. we could not do anything like this these days. Everybody's no. too much of a fucking asshole. Oh yeah, I wouldn't want to. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be. I don't want to be around fucking twenty of people that are my age let alone <laughs> 500,000 god oh and they're <laughs> drinking and they're on drugs no thanks <laughs> listen I've been to some festivals where I'm like okay this is like you get in it and it's like fun and everybody's having a good time and every like that there is a, a specific vibe if you've been to a lot of festivals you know how to act yeah some people don't know how to act Mm-mm. that go to festivals all these people for the most part Knew how to act. Yeah. And also a lot of them were very prepared. Like some of them brought their own food and so they were good. And that's why it worked so well because people who were not prepared, who didn't know what the fuck they were doing, had help from people who were experienced. Mm-hmm. So. 
Uh, I also, I, I said to Pete, I just think people were a little bit smarter and, like, better educated back then, too, and had better manners all around. Like, people yeah. just were, you know, and also there was, like, a lot of serious shit going on, and I don't think people took a lot of things for granted back then. Well, when you're getting drafted against your will, like, yeah. all bets are off, like, I think that really changes the the mood mm-hmm. uh, and priorities amongst people yeah Um, today we nothing affects and i mean certain groups of people are affected more than others obviously yeah Yeah. um but yeah and there's definitely like sense of entitlement among a lot of people of our generation and younger but i also think our generation and younger are we're experiencing different things that are giving us other skill sets that are very important and i think we're doing other things I think a lot of people our age are very conscientious and 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 very smart. Maybe mm-hmm. there's just not a lot of common sense. Who knows? Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Yeah, every generation is better than the one that came before it, but also worse in some ways. <laughs> so you know what? It just depends on what that is. That's true. Yeah. <sighs> Who knows? Well, this sounded like a good time to me. I uh, would have totally gone same easy I, as much as i hate festivals i would have roughed it because you know what if the porta potties were full i would have just gone in the woods because it was surrounded yeah. by woods and everybody yeah. was naked and it was very free and there were hot dogs and yeah it was just it seemed like a good time and also the music you can't go wrong that's right what a time what a time um follow us on social beads yeah that's all i got let's uh yeah wrap it up uh Follow us on social media. Yeah. yeah, DTFU Podcast, all the places. Uh, we have a Patreon if you'd like to check it out. Yeah. Uh, Patreon.com slash DTFU Podcast. Uh, you could email us. Ooh, does anyone have a parent or a relative that went Were to Woodstock? Were you conceived at Woodstock? <gasps> or was your parent conceived at Woodstock? Oh. oh. What? I want to know. Um, uh, yeah. If anybody out there has any Woodstock stories love it. at all. I love, would it. love it. Yeah. Even Woodstock 99. <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah. No, thanks. Although we, yeah, probably people do have some of those. I want to hear those too. Maybe we'll save sure. them for the next one. Yeah. I love it. I yeah. love it. Uh, yeah. Um, thanks for listening guys. As oh. always. Ugh. It's been great. The best. We just love doing this and we love you guys. I probably could have talked about this topic for hours yeah oh this is long and it could have been so much longer i feel like yeah we have so many thoughts and feelings and they're mostly positive yeah for (laughs) for sure for sure yeah uh i'm just mostly shocked that nobody more more people didn't die (laughs) (laughs) that this wasn't more fucked up yeah yeah totally. but it's still pretty fucked up yeah yeah also i'll say it again still better than the fire festival (laughs) a billion times better okay like uh Okay, if you had to go to one, Fire Festival, Gathering of the Juggalos, the Rainbow Gathering, or Woodstock. Woodstock. Yeah, I know. It's not even all day every day. I know. I don't yeah. even know why I asked. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> even if even if you get hookworms, like I I think I might still. Yeah, there's fucking a- wear wear shoes. <laughs> yeah, there's antibiotics. Just go to a doctor. <laughs> yeah, although I bet yeah everybody got like swamp. Or trench foot and fucking, yeah, hookworms and weird butt Swamp stuff. ass. Yeah, swamp ass. <laughs> Everyone for sure had swamp ass. Yeah. Uh, all right. They had swamp everything. Yeah. <laughs> all right, dudes. Thanks for listening. Be excellent to yourselves. And each other. Yeah, buddy. All right. <gasps> We'll talk at you later. Peace. Bye bye. bye. Oh, <laughs> peace and love, man. <laughs> bye bye. <Bye-bye. laughs>